Hello and welcome to my channel. This is Cole Anderson, your host as usual. I'm the independent pianist. Well, my apologies to all of my loyal viewers out there. It finally happened. I missed a week last week. Uh, I was preparing for a concert last Sunday and I got to have a very lovely reunion with my very first piano teacher and all the excitement from all that just totally distracted me from doing a video. So uh, here I am back again though and we'll be carrying on. I'll have some more performance videos coming up pretty soon as well. And today I'm continuing my Great Pianist series with a video on the legendary Hungarian pianist uh, Cifra. This video has been a long time coming. This was a request from a viewer and I think that request came from a, at least a year or two ago and uh, I haven't been able to find exactly who it was who requested it, but whoever it was, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite pianists and a very interesting artist, so I'm very happy to be able to talk about him. Cifra was another one of those artists that was a huge influence on me when I was a teenager. Uh, for better or for worse, you know, in some ways he's not the best person to imitate, given the kind of incredible technical uh, feats that he was capable of. However, there are other sides to his playing besides his enormous technical ability, which I want to really talk about a bit in detail. Cifra was a fascinating character in general. Uh, you can easily find biographical information about him elsewhere, so I, I won't go into too much detail there, but he had a very harrowing, incredible life. Uh, he wrote a very enjoyable memoir as well, uh, called Cannons and Flowers, which is uh, probably at least mostly factual, although some of it reads almost like a Cold War spy novel, but it's very persuasive and interesting and it can give you a good idea of what he went through uh, during the war and afterwards before he escaped from Hungary to make his home in France. Uh, later on in the 50s, 60s, 70s and so forth, he became kind of a household word in France. He was very famous over there uh, and he was also a very generous artist. He helped many young artists find their way by showcasing young talent at his own concerts, which is a wonderful gesture and a, a rare one as well. So as we get into talking about his playing, I have one little caveat I have to get out of the way right off the bat, and I'm afraid I'm probably going to get a fair number of nasty comments because of this, but what can I do? I just have to say right, off the, right away that I really don't like Sifra's playing of Liszt that much. And I realize the high degree of irony in this, since Liszt is the one composer that Sifra was almost synonymous with. And it was wonderful, you know, that Sifra took Liszt very seriously and really showcased a lot of his greatest works. Sifra had a very respectful approach to the, to the score, too, uh, with the exception of some very appropriate improvisation in the Rhapsodies and the like, Sifra tended to be very faithful to Liszt's markings and really treated him like a real composer, which wasn't always something that happened at that time. But if you take my initial appreciation of Sifra's contribution in this regard, coupled with his incredible mechanical gifts, I found that I didn't really care for the overall approach that he had in the Hungarian Rhapsodies or Transcendental Etudes or various other pieces that he was famous for. It's not to say that I didn't really like his playing, per se, it's just that it's so far out of sync with what I consider to be uh, the genuine Liszt style, as far as I can understand it from reading the scores and also reading eyewitness accounts of Liszt's playing and his conducting. So just saying this again, I think that Sifra's playing of Liszt could be very beautiful and extraordinary, very compelling in its way, but it's just that this kind of impulsive firebrand approach, you know, always pushing ahead and playing with a kind of fire-eating virtuosity all the time. It's, to me, that's kind of at odds with the image I have of Liszt's music, as well as the descriptions of Liszt's playing and conducting that have come down to us from many observers. People who heard Liszt in person conduct and play, they tended to note that there was a kind of nobility and warmth to his sound, as well as a breadth and spaciousness of his tempi. Uh, and people remarked on that as often as they did on his incredible technical gifts. So although I find Sifra's playing to be fascinating and intelligent, I don't think it necessarily reflects the true list as I see it. And of course, I'm very much aware this is a matter of opinion, and uh, everyone's going to have a different feeling here. But in a way, someone like Sifra maybe even did a little bit of harm, because he so successfully portrayed certain pieces in List's output in a very flashy, super brilliant way. Uh, he plays them superlatively, of course but it might tend to kind of reinforce the idea that Liszt's music is just fodder for incredible super virtuosos, which I don't think is quite the full picture. At any rate, taking that uh, aside, I think Sifra's 
true artistry in regards to Liszt and many other composers that he played, he had a huge repertoire after all, is very much obscured by the popularity of a few of his most eye-popping performances. So, you know, if you if you type in Sifra's name, you'll likely get uh, Liszt's Grand Gallop will come up, which is an incredible performance. But it's the one that people tend to know, so I'm not even going to quote it here. Uh, that is a great recording, particularly owing to the lightness and clarity of Sifra's sound. It's also one that is frequently imitated with what I find to be less than pleasing results by more recent fire-eating virtuosi. Uh, most people end up making it sound kind of clattery and harsh, but uh, very different from the way Sifra plays it. I think it's kind of a situation uh, kind of akin to what Vladimir Horowitz talked about in regards to big flashy transcriptions. Horowitz said that, you know, he would play all these big things like the Hungarian Rhapsody Number no. 2 in his own arrangement or the Stars and Stripes that he arranged. And what would happen is that people would forget everything else he played. He became just so well known for these transcriptions. And that really caused him to rethink his practice of, of playing these super virtuosic pieces and to focus on playing more serious music. If you think about it, a piece like the Grand Gallop is an extremely small part of Zifra's repertoire, and he had many more nuanced sides to his art than this. You can't blame him for playing the piece anyway. I mean, he could do it, and we're lucky to have his performance, which is incredible. At the same time, it's kind of a shame that this obscures other sides of his artistry. And for me, the repertoire early on where Tsifra's playing really fascinated me it was not what you might expect, actually. Uh, rather than the high romantic stuff, I really loved his approach to Baroque music very much. And unfortunately, he didn't record too many things. Uh, there's a few tantalizing recordings, though, which are absolutely wonderful. They have a kind of limpid beauty and clarity, and also a nobility of sentiment, which I find to be absolutely marvelous. One of my particular favorites is his version of Couperin's uh, Folie Française. Harpsichordists are very familiar with this piece and with Couperin's music in general, but more pianists should become familiar with this underrated masterwork. It actually can sound very wonderful on the piano as well. So it's a wonderful recording. And I'd, I'd also note that Sifra, like many great pianists, had a very specific kind of piano sound that he favored. I imagine he must have had his pianos very carefully regulated because I've never really heard a piano tone quite like that from anyone else. His preference seemed to have been for a very bright, clear, glassy, even somewhat thin sounding instrument. Uh, the tone that he gets from his instrument, though, can take on a remarkably intimate quality and a kind of poetic dreaminess in more reflective music. And this sound just happens to perfectly suit the Baroque repertoire. It has a little bit of something harpsichordish about it. And you'll notice I also uh, call attention to his wonderful pedaling, his half pedaling effects that kind of call to mind the undamped sound of the harpsichord in the Couperin. Moving forward to some more rather unusual repertoire, I think it's the only piece by Mendelssohn that he ever played, the Rondo Capriccioso. I think this is a unique and absolutely unmatched recording. I've never heard anything like it. It's a famous piece, and this recording should really be much more well known. Here, Sifra finds an unbelievable lightness and transparency. Just listen a little bit to the beginning.
Listen also to the very characteristic poetic sound that Sifra finds through his understated way of phrasing melodies. Again, very limpid, pure, very delicate. Again, as in the Couperin, Sifra uses very subtle half pedaling in this piece to create this kind of sheen and glow to the sound. Rather than simply playing dry all the time as most would do, uh, this gives his sound a really unique quality, a really remarkable quality, which is extremely beautiful. Most pianists underestimate how much you can do with half pedal effects. In fact, it's, it's fairly rare that you really need the full resonance of the pedal. Uh, it's oftentimes more effective to just press down the pedal a quarter or a half of the way, and you can get all kinds of wonderful magical effects. I would like to mention another very unusual recording of Tsifras that I very much like. Uh, this is a piece of virtuosity that is not so obviously flashy as his arrangements and some of the list things that he played, but it's no less impressive. Uh, that's the Brahms Paganini Variations. If you don't know about the Brahms Paganini Variations, they are one of the touchstones of pianistic technique in the 19th century, right up there with the Chopin etudes and the Liszt transcendental etudes. Uh, I actually don't really like these pieces very much, and I usually find that they're played in kind of a heavy-handed and unimaginative way. This actually goes for much of Brahms's music. I think there's much more there than people usually bring out. But all that goes out the window with Zifra's Quicksilver approach, which really brings Paganini to the forefront of your mind and violin virtuosity. I even prefer Tsifra's complete recording of both books to the legendary uh, Michelangeli version. Michelangeli did an abridged version with both books combined. Uh, Michelangeli's version is remarkable, but it's much more cut and dried to my ear, and Tsifra brings so much playfulness and lightness to this piece, and to a composer that's often played in such a dull way to my ear. Again, there's a kind of unpretentious virtuosity in the way he plays this piece that's very striking.
Another recording, which is probably not very well known to most people, but which I also absolutely love, is Zifra's studio version of the well-known Rondo by Beethoven, sometimes called Rage Over a Lost Penny. This is not Beethoven's title, but it's a posthumously published uh, rondo that was actually written much earlier in Beethoven's career. And it's a charming little showpiece. And to really get a feel for how wonderful and unique Zifra's recording is, let's uh, compare it side by side with another famous performance, which is a little bit more in the standard line of things. This is a live recording by Evgeny Kissin. So, an incredible recording, no argument there, uh, but let's take a look at Sifra, who approaches this piece in an entirely different way. So I don't know about you, but to me, the Kissin version, while well, very excellent and brilliant, sounds pretty bullish next to the kind of charming and delicate Sifra version. Technically, this is a remarkable display from Sifra as well, as much in his control and his lightness as in anything else. He tosses everything off with this kind of ease and nonchalance, as opposed to the more steely approach of Kissin. So anyway, while they're both excellent and you might prefer one to the other, for me, Sifra's approach is much more after my own heart. And there's so many other recordings I could mention, which are a little outside the scope of this video. Um, there's an amazing live recording of Tiffer playing Bartok's Concerto Number no. 2, and this was actually the Hungarian premiere of the work, and Tiffer escaped from Hungary the next day to make his, his way to France, where, of course, he finally found the reception he deserved. So I hope this gives you some food for thought about this remarkable pianist. And one of his best qualities, as I've kind of hinted at, was that although he had these enormous technical reserves at the piano, he usually didn't seem like he needed to show off at all, and there's a wonderful understatement to his virtuosity. Oftentimes, you're not even aware that something is really difficult, especially if you're not looking at his fingers, if you're just listening. It's like the difficulties just vanish into music, which is really the ideal, of course. So, as you can see, he was much more than simply a pyrotechnical wizard. He was a real poet and a painter in sound at the keyboard. So, I hope this inspires you to go and look up some more unusual recordings from Zifra. There are many out there besides the more famous things, his transcriptions and the list pieces and so forth that are really worth looking into. Please do also uh, consider supporting the channel if you like this content. A very easy way to do that is on patreon.com, uh, www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist. 
Uh, you can also make one-time donations through other methods I have in the description box. Uh, stay tuned next week as well. I'm going to get back into some performance videos uh, of my own. Uh, there's going to be more Chopin etudes and some other interesting list transcriptions and, and various other interesting things. So I uh, hope to see you next week for some more great music. Uh, thanks very much and take care.